Oh, thank you, John. Thank you so much. And uh, here's the book. I just happen to have a copy with me. Um, I carry this around in case of emergency. They are for sale out front. This is my other book, by the way. Um, I'm just going to hold these right here while I speak. I hope you don't mind. It gets distracting to some people, but you'll get used to it. I mean, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're all so uh, uh, full of energy after lunch. And um, I'm especially excited to be here um, to talk about Robert Lincoln, a much overlooked and much maligned figure in the Lincoln legacy. Now, on election night, November 6, 1860, with uh, throngs of crowds eagerly milling around Cambridge, Massachusetts, waiting to hear the presidential results, a group of Robert Lincoln's friends, assuming a Republican victory, mounted him on a fence rail in allusion to his rail splitter father and bore him around in triumph, the newspaper said, accompanied by torches and uproarious demonstrations. The next day, after Abraham Lincoln's victory was known to the nation, another group of students called on Robert Lincoln in his dorm room. This one was much more formal and much less boisterous, and they wanted to congratulate him on his father's election. One newspaper reported, the young man is said to be a worthy scion of the old stock and is quite popular among his fellow students. Thus was Robert Lincoln transformed from a simple college student to the oldest son of the president-elect of the United States. Now, Robert was in his first term as a freshman at Harvard College when his father was elected. When the term ended on January 16, 1861, Robert returned to Springfield, and it was his first visit home in about 18 months. While the city had grown and changed quite a bit since his departure in 1859, so had Robert himself. As one newspaper reported about Robert's first day in Springfield, said the heir apparent of the president-elect has been the observed of all the observing girls in Springfield today, <laughs> as he accompanied his father around the town. The newspaper said the effect of a residence within the improving influences of genteel and well-dressed and well-behaved Boston is plainly noticeable in his outward appearance the comparative elegance of which certainly presents a striking contrast to the loose, careless, awkward rigging of his presidential father. <laughs> now, while Robert's return to Springfield was certainly to visit family and friends, the main purpose was to assist his father and to accompany him to Washington, D.C. Family friend Mercy Conkling wrote in November 1860, Bob will be here about the 20th of January and will remain with Mr. Lincoln until after the inauguration. In February, Conkling wrote, Bob figures quite largely in the day-to-day -day life of the president-elect. Now exactly what he did or did not do to assist his father is not specifically known. Now, if Robert had been a college graduate at this time, his father may have made him a presidential secretary or assistant, as some of the other cabinet members had done with their sons. But. The one thing we do know is that Robert was the only member of the Lincoln family to accompany his father all the way from Springfield to Washington, uh, not including the late night sneak into D.C., of course. Lincoln's inaugural journey by train from Springfield to D.C. was not only, of course, a necessity by the limits of transportation in 1861, but it was also sort of a public relations tour. All of the people who had only read Lincoln's words in the newspaper, now they could see him in person and perhaps meet him. And the journey was scheduled to go through 11 major cities, and at every stop, the presidential party was feted by crowds and bands and journalists and local dignitaries and well-wishers. 17-year-old Robert took full advantage of this journey. Uh, he was found by local youths at every stop, and he was plied with cigars, alcohol, flattery, pageantry, and attention fit for a prince, or the Prince of Rails, as he was called. Now, this revelry actually got Robert into some serious trouble after only one day out on the train. Uh, it's a fairly famous story when he almost lost his father's inaugural address. According to Ward Lamon, who was uh, Abraham Lincoln's law associate and uh, self-appointed bodyguard, uh, it was the only time he had ever seen his jovial and patient friend so angry. Lincoln had put his speech in a black oilcloth bag and he had given it to his oldest son and told him to take care of it, but he didn't tell Robert what was in it. So when the train reached Indianapolis that night, it was greeted at the station by what John Nicolay estimated were about 50,000 people. 
Robert was immediately besieged by all the local teenagers, and they carried him off to the hotel in a big raucous celebration. Abraham Lincoln reached the hotel long after Robert did, but he was anxious about his black bag and where it was. So it took him a while to find Robert, and when he did, and he asked where the bag was, Robert, uh, unaware that it was actually important at all, he simply said, oh, you know, I gave it to the clerk at the desk. Which, of course, Lincoln was, uh, he was horrified. He rushed to the front, he galloped over the counter, and he dove through all the ba- black bags there until he could find his. And uh, according to various stories, um, including Robert, uh, Lincoln then thrust the bag at his son and said, now you keep it. And interestingly, Robert later said, uh, father did not scold me. He actually never alluded to it again, which is somewhat at odds with how Ward Lamon and other people have said the incident ended. But 17-year-old Robert, who was at the height of his adolescence during this trip, he experienced the journey as a typical teenager. He had as much fun as he possibly could, and he availed himself of every opportunity to have that fun. It was reported uh, in one newspaper that his gay colloquial ways contributed regularly to the general good feeling on the train. Now, he spent most of his time with 22-year-old John Hay, one of Lincoln's secretaries, And they were chumming around. There was a lot of socializing. Robert loved to drink. He loved to smoke. He loved to flirt with girls. Unlike his father, he enjoyed alcohol. And as uh, journalist Henry Villard reported that for the entire trip, Robert adhered closely to the refreshment saloon, the gayest of the gay. (laughs) And Villard actually marveled at Robert's drinking prowess. He said that in Cincinnati, the local youth had just plied him with sparkling catawba, which was a form of champagne, and yet the next morning, Robert was fine. He had no, no ill effects of a night of drinking, so apparently Robert uh, could hold his liquor. Now, Robert also had a penchant for smoking. He loved cigars for his entire life, kind of like Winston Churchill. I can't even tell you how many he must have smoked every day. And uh, in report, it was reported in Albany, New York, that he thinks of nothing just now but cigars, and he has indulged in all sorts of uproarious merriment while they have been in Albany, and he was in the saloon car. Now, when the presidential party reached Washington, Robert not only continued all of this merriment, but he also assisted his father in preparation for the inaugural ceremony. Again, the complete extent of this assistance is unclear, but we do know that on February 25th, Robert accompanied his father for a walk around D.C. for what was reported uh, uh, said that there might be a physical stratum on which to rest the mental labors of the day. Robert apparently was a sounding board for his father, who read his inaugural address aloud the night before the ceremony, and Robert was in the room when that happened. Now, after the ceremony, of the inaugural ceremony, Robert was with his father at the White House, and he remembered watching President Buchanan give his father the key to the front door of the White House. Uh, What Robert did not see, one of my favorite stories, uh, John Hay, who was there, of course, they were all in the room having the big celebration, and he just happened to be nearby when President Buchanan took President Lincoln aside, away from everybody else. And John Hay wrote in his diary, I was prepared to hear some great, wonderful state secrets when I heard President Buchanan say, I think you'll find that the water in the right-hand cistern is better than in the left. (laughs) I love that. Presidents are men, too, apparently. Now, Robert returned to Harvard on March 6th, two days after his father's inauguration. And of course, being the son of the president, Robert was besieged at college by well-wishers, by job seekers, by journalists, and by sycophants of various stripes. One interesting incident occurred not long after the inaugural when a job seeker asked Robert to uh, intervene with his father to help this guy get an appointment as the postmaster of Cambridge. So Robert wrote the letter in the one and only time, well, Let me take that back. In the first time, he approached uh, his father about a political favor, and the president very quickly and very tersely replied, if you do not attend to your studies and let matters such as you write about alone, I will take you away from college. And according to one of Robert's friends, Robert carried that letter in his pocket for many years, and whenever anyone asked for a favor, he would pull it out. (laughs) Can't help you. (laughs) Now, when the war broke out, Robert, just like so many young men at the time, wanted to enlist in the Army, apparently as a private. Um, I have never found anything to suggest otherwise. Um, 
Robert had always been interested in military matters. Of course, I'm sure his father told him about his experiences in the Black Hawk War. Robert lived for a little while in Washington during the Mexican War when his father was a congressman. In Springfield, Robert was on the Springfield Cadets, which was kind of a you know, quasi-military uh, kind of grouping. And as Robert later wrote in a letter, in those days a young man had an unpleasant feeling if he could not take some part in the war. Both Robert's aunt and his mother's seamstress at the White House, Elizabeth Kenkley, recalled how ardently he wanted to join the army. But despite his enthusiasm and his father's uh, well-known egalitarianism, Robert's eagerness for military service was blocked by his parents, specifically by his mother, Mary. Now, Mary was terrified that Robert would be killed in battle, and she refused to allow him to go. Publicly, she said that Robert needed to finish his education, and as she told one senator, an educated man can serve his country better than an ignoramus. <laughs> but privately, she told her husband, we've lost one son, and this, his loss is as much as I can bear without having to make another sacrifice. And while the president argued that some mothers had lost all of their children, and Mary should not be so selfish, Lincoln, of course, he knew his wife. He was aware of her emotional and mental frailties, and he did not want to impose this burden of fear on her. And so he acquiesced to her, and he refused to allow Robert to join. But in addition to his wife's fears, Abraham Lincoln had his own fears about Robert's enlistment. The president was afraid that his political enemies would use or abuse his soldier son in a way to cause the president public embarrassment or interfere with his public duties. Now, this had already happened with Mary Lincoln, and it happened throughout the presidency, people talking about her spending habits or her general bad behavior. And Lincoln, of course, was a very shrewd politician, and he knew the game. And in fact, in later life, Robert more than once said that this was the reason his father did not let him join, more so than his mother's fear about him getting killed. Now, of course, newspapers excoriated President Lincoln for the fact that he was more than willing to let other men's sons die for their country, but his own son was safe at Harvard. Members of Congress even criticized him. Robert in the newspapers was called generally either a coward or a shirker. Uh, we don't know what classmates at Harvard said to him or thought of him, but we know that Robert was angry about it, and he was very resentful, but he was, he was a dutiful son. He was, um, he was then and later in life a, a truly quintessential Victorian-era gentleman at which he learned at Phillips Exeter Academy and at Harvard. And so being the dutiful and conscientious son that he was, he may have resented it, but all he could do was continue his education and hope that his parents would change their minds. And even though Robert was the son of the president during his years at college, he had no ego about it. He never put on any airs. He made no demands. And he never, ever traded on his name. And in fact, he was a, a very boisterous young man. He was a great socializer. Just like his father, he was a great raconteur, and he was uh, a fabulous jokester. Every, all of his friends talked about how funny he was. And they all said he was a universally popular classmate. And they all agreed that Robert Lincoln's dorm room was more like a social salon for four years than it was for a kind of a room of study. As one of his classmates wrote, if his own stories about himself were true, he had considerable ground sowed to wild oats during a part of his college course. But Robert's fun-loving ways, again, got him into trouble. He was mentioned multiple times in the faculty meeting minutes for various uh, episodes of rule breaking. As a freshman, he was fined $2 for writing on settees in Mr. Bates's room. As a sophomore and a junior, he was admonished uh, multiple times for offenses not stated, and he was punished for, uh, by reciting 10 prayers for his transgression. But his worst offense was when he was a junior and he was caught smoking in public, which was specifically against college rules. When he was caught in September, he was privately admonished. When he was caught again in December, the president of the college sent a letter to President Lincoln suggesting that he have a talk with his son about his ungentlemanly behavior. But you know, in general, Robert was a good student at Harvard, although he was not a great one. And he once said he studied hard enough to pass, but not hard enough so that he could be considered a dig by his classmates. He was an avid athlete, especially he loved baseball, and he was a good bowler, and he joined numerous clubs and organizations 
such as the Institute of 1770, Delta Kappa Epsilon Fraternity, the Porcellian Club, and of course the famed Hasty Pudding Club. Now the amount of time that Robert spent at the White House during his college years has long been misunderstood and misrepresented. It is generally believed and repeated that Robert knew little about his father's work during the war and that he cared even less. And the simple fact is that this is not true. Part of this comes from Robert himself, especially uh, a statement that he wrote in 1865 to biographer Josiah G. Holland in which Robert said, I scarcely ever had two minutes quiet talk with my father during his presidency. I have seen numerous letters throughout Robert's life in which he always told inquirers that he was away at school during the war and he didn't know anything that would ever help them or, or that they could find interesting. But as I said, this was simply not true. This was actually a line that Robert used throughout his entire life to avoid inserting himself into his father's legacy and also to avoid being hounded by historians, both things that Robert adamantly avoided during his entire life. And the truth, in fact, is that during the Civil War, Robert was at the White House more often than anyone has ever supposed. He visited the White House for at least a portion of every single break from college that he had. We know, of course, that he spent a lot of time with his mother, which is a subject for another talk. Um, but my research has uncovered that Robert Lincoln was not only close to his father, but that he was, in fact, his father's confidant during the Civil War. Now, this conclusion I have come to after about 10 years of research on Robert's life. I have compiled and viewed thousands of Robert's letters from archives across the country. But this also comes from Robert's own pen. He once wrote to former War Department cipher operator Charles A. Tinker, um, Robert lamented the fact that he kept no notes of his experiences during his father's administration. Robert wrote, it is a very great regret to me that I did not do so because on several occasions my father and his desire to unburden himself to someone in whom he could have entire confidence gave me brief statements of the condition of things which were very much troubling him and which I ought to have jotted down. But Robert actually did jot them down, just not in a notebook. He wrote them in numerous letters to various people throughout his life. Now taking them chronologically, the first major confidence of father to son was about the cabinet crisis of 1862 when a group of radical Republican senators demanded a reorganization of the cabinet, specifically the removal of Secretary of State Seward. Now, their anger was based primarily on statements made by Treasury Secretary Chase, in which he said the cabinet was never consulted on important matters and that uh, they suffered from a paralyzing disharmony. The senators became so critical that Seward offered his resignation. Uh, Lincoln invited the senators, as well as the full cabinet, to the White House, unknown to either party, at which time he polled every member of the cabinet and asked them whether there was any lack of unity or any lack of consultation between him and the cabinet. And, of course, Chase was put on the spot. Does he show disloyalty to his president, or does he directly contradict everything he had been telling these senators? And, of course, he caved in and he declared that everything was fine. According to Robert Lincoln, Senator Lyman Trumbull was furious, and he said, Lincoln, someone has lied like hell. <laughs> Not tonight, the president replied quietly. And in fact, <laughs> see, I've always thought that was funny. I was, uh, I was afraid nobody was going to laugh at that. Uh, Robert actually told that story. That it's, it's a much deeper story. I summarized it. He told the complete story as his father told it to him, to Helen Nicolay, and she wrote it in her book about her father called Lincoln's Secretary. And uh, this uh, Lincoln told to his son uh, just a few days after it happened when Robert came home for his Christmas recess. Now, probably the most noticeable, notable rec recollection of Robert Lincoln was in witnessing his father's anguished reaction to the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg. This was, of course, the failure of General Meade to pursue General Lee and destroy the army after they had lost the battle. Robert often said that this moment is most vividly impressed upon my mind. And he wrote or spoke about this numerous times in his life. And uh, just a quick survey of, of what happened. After the repulsive pickets charge on the third day of battle, the Confederates began a slow retreat back to Virginia. Lee's supply lines and the trains of wounded stretched for miles. Meade followed Lee for 10 days 
consolidating his army, but he refused to engage in a battle with him. Now, President Lincoln, right after the Battle of Gettysburg, of course, was very pleased that Meade had won the battle. But he quickly became impatient that Meade was not engaging, and he began to detect a whiff of McClellan's old procrastination in Meade's excuses. When Lee reached the Potomac River, it was swollen by heavy rain, and Lincoln saw this as Meade's opportunity to crush Lee's army and finish the war. When no battle occurred, and Lee escaped across the river on July 14th, Lincoln was devastated by the news, and he scolded Meade in a pretty harsh letter that he ultimately did not send, but which still survives today. Now, Robert was in Washington during this time, and he remembered very clearly his father's anguish. He later recalled going into his father's office and finding him, quote, in much distress, his head leaning upon his arms upon the desk in front of him, and when he raised his head, there were evidences of tears upon his face. The president told his son that he believed Meade could have dealt the final blow to Lee's army while it was trapped with its back to the river, but the general had refused all entreaties to act. Lincoln also told his son about the letter of rebuke that he wrote but did not send the day before. And John Hay's diary refer, uh, confirms Robert's recollection because on July 15th, Hay wrote, RTL says the tycoon is grieved silently but deeply about the escape of Lee. He said, if I had gone up there, I could have whipped them myself. I know he had that idea. And Robert again dismissed or discussed Meade's passivity with his father in mid-October when Lee's army was once again trapped with its back to a river, this time the Rapidan in Virginia. Lincoln instructed Meade to attack. And he said, if you win, you take all the glory. And if you lose, I will take all the blame. Robert later wrote, I remember the contents of that telegram because father read it to me before he sent it. Once again, Lee escaped, and Lincoln was disappointed. Another interesting event during the administration that Robert experienced was after the issuance of the now famous Pomeroy Circular, which was quite simply... Um, written by a Republican senator on behalf of numerous other senators who decried the ineptitude of the Lincoln administration and they wanted to get rid of Lincoln and have a new nominee in 1864, specifically Secretary Chase. And this uh, was the follow-up to uh, another circular that had been issued just a few weeks later to the same premise. Now, when the Washington National Intelligencer published Pomeroy's circular on February 22nd, the corridor outside the Oval Office was thronged with people, and they all wanted to meet the president and talk to him about this. Robert Lincoln was passing through this crowd, and he was grabbed by Simon Hanscom, the editor of the Washington National Republican newspaper. And Hanscom begged him to get him in to see his father so they could talk about it, which Robert did. And that night after dinner, the president entered Robert's bedroom to show him a letter he had just received from Secretary Chase denying any knowledge of the circular and offering his resignation. Robert later wrote about it. My father asked me to lay out writing materials for him, and at my table he wrote a short note to Mr. Chase in which he said in substance that he knew of no reason why he should not remain in the cabinet. Upon his showing this note to me, I expressed surprise, and I asked him if he had not seen the circular. He stopped me and said he didn't know anything about it that a good many people during the day had tried to see him and tell him something, and that he supposed it was some new piece of Chase's devilry, but it did not suit him to know anything about it. And therefore, his remark in the letter, declining to accept the resignation, was strictly true. Thereupon, at his request, I called a messenger, and the note to Mr. Chase was sent. In January 1865, Robert also had a discussion with his father about the events leading up to the February 3rd Hampton Roads Peace Conference which took place between President Lincoln, Secretary Seward, and three representatives of the Confederate government. The Confederates had traveled to Grant's headquarters at City Point, Virginia, asking to pass through the lines to go to Washington. And of course, they were not allowed. After weeks of telegrams between Lincoln and the Army and the Confederates, Lincoln finally got frustrated, and he sent Thomas Eckert, who worked in the telegraph office, as his personal envoy to straighten out the situation. <coughs> I remember my father telling me one evening all that had occurred up to that point in the matter, Robert recalled, and his indicating to me that he was not feeling quite comfortable as to the way in which the matter was being handled at Army headquarters, and that therefore he had that day sent Tom Eckert, as he affectionately called him, with written instructions to handle the whole matter. Now, Eckert was well known to Lincoln because Lincoln spent so much time in the telegraph office, 
And in fact, Robert recalled his father telling him that he trusted Eckert implicitly because he, quote, never failed to do completely what was given to him and to do it in the most complete and tactful manner and to refrain from doing anything outside which would hurt his mission. The president was so emphatic in, in, in expressing this reason for sending General Eckert that it made a deep impression upon me, Robert remembered, and I never see General Eckert without thinking of it. Now, Lincoln eventually sent Seward, and he himself, of course, they went to Fort Monroe, and they met with the commissioners, and no agreements were reached. And finally, during the war, Robert also at times acted, or tried to act, as a bodyguard for his father. He, whenever he was home, he would notice that his father would walk from the White House to the telegraph office late at night by himself without an escort. And Robert couldn't believe it, and he remonstrated against his father for doing that. And he said, if you have to go out, come wake me up, and I will go with you. And he remembered numerous times during the war in which his father did actually come up to his room and wake him up, and Robert quickly got dressed and walked with his father to the telegraph office. And by the time of Abraham Lincoln's re-election in 1864, Robert had graduated from Harvard. His parents, however, still refused to let him join the army. Now, although uh, supposedly he was no longer an ignoramus, as his mother said, um, but I think the death of Willie, of course, in 1862, um, made Mary even more terrified than she had been before that Robert might be killed in battle. Robert, again, was very angry and resentful that his parents still wouldn't let him join the army. And so he said, well, if you won't let me join, then I'll go back to Harvard, I guess, and I'll go to law school. But every time he saw his parents, he renewed his pleas to join the army. And by the beginning of 1865, as Union victory was all but imminent, the president finally changed his mind. Now, Robert, as usual, returned to the White House in January 65 for his winter break, and he said that it was on that visit that he had specifically come to Washington to press upon my father my wish to see some military service before the close of the war. And he may have finally convinced his father to relent, but it was not a complete concession for Abraham Lincoln as a father. He still wanted to protect his son, not only for his son's sake and his wife's sake, but also for his own sake. And on January 19th, Lincoln wrote, uh, which I'm sure we've all read, his famous letter to General Grant asking to place his son on the staff. One historian has actually even concluded that in asking for this special favor for his son, that Lincoln veered slightly from his usual moral and ethical path, which I disagree with. I mean, he certainly used his influence to get Robert a safer assignment, but in those days, military commissions were almost all gotten by political uh, connections. But also, Robert was a Harvard graduate, and so he was more than qualified to hold any kind of commission. And of course, we know Grant said yes, so finally, after four years of waiting, Robert joined the Army. He officially entered on February 20th, 1865, and left Washington to report to Grant's headquarters at City Point. His father had paid for his outfit and his equipment and bought him a horse. And Lincoln was very proud of his son. One congressman's son later remembered President Lincoln boasting to him, you know, my boy here has just been made a captain on Grant's staff. But President Lincoln was anxious about his son, um, just a day or two after Robert left Washington, uh, Lincoln telegraphed Grant and said, uh, has Robert arrived yet? I haven't heard anything. And he's very uh, obviously worried about it. And Grant replied, oh, yes, he arrived yesterday. And Robert reported for duty on February 23rd. Now, Colonel Horace Porter, who was a member of Grant's staff, later remembered Robert coming in his memoirs. He said the new acquisition at headquarters soon became exceedingly popular. He had inherited many of the genial traits of his father, and entered heartily into all the social pastimes at headquarters. He was always ready to perform his share of hard work and never expected to be treated differently from any other officer. Captain Lincoln was, of course, the president's son, and he was given leave to attend the inauguration, even though he had only been on active duty for less than two weeks. He attended on March 4th. He attended the inaugural receptions and the balls, and he was back in City Point by March 7th. Now, Robert's duties in the Army um, are not fully known, but I know that he acted as a courier between generals. One letter shows that he stood guard duty. But many of Robert's duties actually involved his father. When the president visited City Point in late March, which was uh, something that was partially arranged by Robert, actually, Captain Lincoln met his family at the dock, 
he informed General Grant that they were there, and then he escorted General Grant and his wife to the president's boat. Robert escorted his father to the front lines to inspect the troops on March 26th, and he accompanied his father to the observation tower at Point of Rocks, Maryland, on March 27th. On March 29th, when Grant began his final push against Lee's army, he moved his staff and his headquarters to the front, and it was during this time that Robert Lincoln participated in the final fall of Petersburg and Richmond. And again, it's not known exactly what Robert did, but you know the fighting was continuous. The troops were attacking and retreating. They were advancing and shifting. There was a relentless sending of dispatches between commanding officers, and certainly Robert, like all the junior officers of the staff, was busy and in constant motion during that entire time, saw the battle, possibly saw blood, and, and he probably had very little rest for a number of days. And it's said that the president during this time, like any father, was extremely anxious about the safety of his son and that he did not feel relieved until he saw Robert for himself in Petersburg on April 3rd. Lincoln telegraphed to his wife, Ted and I have been to Richmond and been with Bob for four or five hours. He is well and in good spirits. After Lincoln returned to City Point, Grant followed uh, the Army of the Potomac on the final push all the way up to Appomattox on April 9th. And it's not generally known, actually, that Captain Robert Lincoln, as a member of Grant's staff, was personally present at the McLean House that day for the surrender. And it's interesting that in later years, in the early 20th century, Robert Lincoln was not only known as the son of Abraham Lincoln, he was also known as the last living person to be present at the surrender at Appomattox. And Robert wrote or spoke about his experiences at Appomattox numerous times throughout his life. He explained how when Grant entered the McLean House, all the junior officers, of which Robert was one, stayed out on the porch. When the conference and the surrender was over, all of the officers were invited in to meet General Lee. Robert later told a newspaper reporter, looking back into history, the events on that day form a page that can never be forgotten, especially by those who were present on that occasion. When the reporter pressed him for more details, looking for more of the dramatic nature of the scene, Robert, somewhat anticlimactically, said, well, as I recall the scene now, it appeared to be a very ordinary transaction. It seemed as if I had just sold you a house, and we had but to pass the titles to each other. The young captain accompanied General Grant and his cortege back to Washington the next morning, and they arrived in Washington to ringing bells, shooting cannons, waving flags, and a general joyous celebration throughout the city. Robert, just like his commanding officer, General Grant, took no time to languish in the parades or the pageantry. He simply mounted his horse and rode from the wharf to the White House, and he found his family at breakfast that morning, April 14th. Robert was the first person to give his father an eyewitness account of Lee's surrender. The son had even brought his father a photograph of the Confederate commander, to which the president, after thoughtful scrutiny of it, said, it is a good face. It is the face of a noble, noble, brave man. I'm glad the war is over at last. After breakfast, Robert spent a few hours alone talking with his father, recounting to him the final days of the campaign. And the president was, in fact, so eager to spend time with his oldest son that he postponed his morning cabinet meeting by two hours so that he could see something of Robert before I go to work. After dinner that evening, the president went to Robert's room and asked him some more questions about Lee's surrender. Robert later wrote, he came into my room just before going to the theater and talked with me, but I do not recall that it was anything of importance. Robert, tired after two weeks out in the field, having not slept in a proper bed or probably even with his uniform off for that entire time, told his father that he wanted to stay home and go to bed early that night. That night, of course, President Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth. Robert Lincoln was not in the theater at the time. But he was at the Peterson house afterward, and he endured what he later called that very dreadful night, watching the doctors work, standing over his father's bed, consoling his mother in the front room. <laughs> President Lincoln, of course, died at 7.22 a.m. the next morning. Secretary of War Stanton, more distraught at the murder of his friend than subsequent historians have given him credit for, uttered the now famous, and perhaps inaccurate, phrase about his chief, now he belongs to the ages, and Robert Lincoln's world was changed forever. Thank you.
questions? Stunned you all into silence? <laughs> Did Robert uh, burn any of his father's papers? Oh, excellent question. Generally one of the first questions I always get. Um, a very interesting, long, detailed answer. Um, we know that Robert burned a lot of his own papers. He wrote notes about which ones he actually burned. Uh, we know that he burned some of his mother's papers, as John said, especially ones about the uh, insanity case. Um, the thing about Robert and his father's papers is that um, Robert helped Nicolay and Hay box them all up in the White House after the assassination, and they were sent to David Davis's vault in Bloomington, and they stayed there till 1874. Robert then never looked through them. He kept wanting to, but he never had the time. He gave them to John Nicolay without looking through them, and Nicolay took them to Washington, and he and Hay wrote their book. When Nicolay died in 1901, they were transferred over to Hay, who was Secretary of State, and he kept them in the State Department. And it was not until about 1905, after Hay was dead, that Robert made plans to take possession of all the papers. In 1908, people were asking him for papers for exhibits for the 1909 centennial. And Robert said, I haven't looked through the papers yet. So from 1865 to 1909, Robert actually never looked through the papers, which a lot of people don't realize. Um, I personally don't think, I know Robert did not burn anything of his father's that had historical value because he knew the value of the papers, and he knew his father's historical place. If he burned anything at all, and he often talked about purging the papers, although he never actually did it, and Nicolay actually once wrote him a letter saying, don't do anything, don't touch anything, don't burn anything, every little scrap could be important, and you might not even know about it because you weren't his secretary, I was, so let me look at it before you touch it. And so, you know, if Robert burned anything, I would think they'd be little scraps where he said, Lincoln, you know, meet me at 9 a.m., A. Lincoln. Um, because Robert always talked about purging, but purging things that were inconsequential. So, the, you know, there's the famous story uh, by Nicholas Murray Butler that in 1923, he went to visit Robert at Robert's House Hill Dean up in Manchester, Vermont, which is still there. Wonderful place. Highly recommend it. And he said, I walked in. It was all very dramatic. I walked in, and Robert was in his office, and he had, you know, 18 trunks around him, and he was burning everything. And I said, Robert, what are you doing? You can't do that. Your father belongs to the American people. Stop. You need to donate those to the Library of Congress. And uh, the interesting thing was that that occurred in 1923, and yet in 1919, Robert had given everything he owned to the Library of Congress. <laughs> so we know that story's not true. Um, interestingly, Freddie Towers, the son of Frederick Towers, Robert's uh, personal assistant, uh, secretary, what have you, um, he told me that his father told him that he once walked in on Robert burning papers, which he said proved, or not proved, that they were related to the fact that Edwin Stanton was complicit in the assassination. I believe that story because, of course, Stanton had nothing to do with it, and Robert knew that. Robert loved Stanton. One of my favorite stories that I've never seen published, uh, Robert wrote about it two or three times, where he said, um, he always said, everybody thinks wrong. They think badly of Stanton, but he was a great man. He said, I would not care to have it published but I will tell you that for more than 10 days after my father's death, every morning he came to my room, stood in the doorway, and cried without saying a word. Robert knew Stanton had nothing to do with it, and he was always, every day he got mail, asking for favors, asking for mementos, getting a book, getting a poem, getting a painting, getting a sculpture, asking for his opinion every single day of his life. And, uh, you know, he got a lot of stuff that was just junk. And... If he did get something that said Stanton was complicit, I would think Robert would burn it because Robert despised journalists and historians. He thought they were always wrong, whether on purpose or not, generally on purpose. And my personal belief would be if he has this information, he would think, well, if anybody else got it, they would probably write some stupid book that said Stanton was involved, which he wasn't. So I would believe if he had that, that he would burn it. But um, I have no evidence that he specifically burned loads of his father's papers as as people have uh, accused him of doing. Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Dr. Emerson, uh, thank you for the facts and your research. Uh, for those new to the symposia and to some of Lincoln's thing, could you comment on what Robert went on to do after the death of his father? And also, assuming the uh, 
blood uh, family love and solace which was there were there any quotes uh, of him saying anything to his father for uh, whatever lightening up or have a faith or whatever uh, quotes to his father about just how he felt about him yes. just like their relationship the, war, the weight of the oh the weight of the war um, not really Robert he, he always refrained from commenting about his father as I said he did not like to, he thought he was imposing himself upon his father's legacy, which he thought he had no right to do. Um, but he also said, many times, he said, I didn't take any notes, and I don't want to argue about my memory, because it's my memory and I can't prove it. I'm not going to argue with you about it. And people always asked him his opinion on things, and he said, well, I know what I know, but I'm not going to get into a discussion because I don't want to argue about it. But um, Robert was a great man. He was an, he was an amazing man. Um, he became a lawyer, one of the most prominent lawyers in Chicago. Secretary of War under Garfield and Arthur, Minister to Great Britain under Harrison, President of the Chicago Telephone Company, President of the Chicago Gas, Light, and Coke Company, President of the Pullman Car Company, self-made multimillionaire, and of course the keeper of his father's papers and his father's legacy. Um, Robert, I think he and his father had a very close relationship. Uh, a lot of people ask me, oh, well, he didn't like his father, right? He was embarrassed by him. Right? No, that's not true. They had as close of a relationship as they could, given the state of their lives. Abraham Lincoln was gone six to nine months of the year on the law circuit. Then, of course, as he got into politics, he was out politicking. And he was gone, and Robert was home, and Robert was with Mary, which is why he and Mary were incredibly close, all the way up until 1875, until he had her committed. But Robert was never embarrassed. He was incredibly proud of his father, and he revered his memory very highly, which is why he was so selective and so at times um, terse with people who kept bothering him about his father's legacy. Which, you know, I always tell people, you know, if up in Manchester, Vermont, people would say, oh, yeah, well, you know, my grandfather used to play golf. Or no, he, he saw Robert on the golf course, and he said, oh, Robert was a mean man. He never wanted to talk. I'm like, you know, think about this. You're the son of Abraham Lincoln, the greatest American in the history of, of the country to most people. Every single day, people ask you something about your father, after 60 years of that, yeah. you just want to play golf. You know? I mean, <laughs> just leave me alone. Let me hit my shot. So, um, you know, Robert's life is incredibly intricate, um, his own accomplishments. Plus, of course, you have to weave him in with his father and his mother and his brothers and everything, the context of the world in which he was in. You know, he was, he was at the train station when Garfield died. He was approaching Buffalo when McKinley died. He wasn't there. Um, well, there's so many things. My book's going to be about 800 or 900 pages long, actually. Yeah. It'll be worth it, though. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, everyone, everyone knows that story about Lincoln being so upset with Meade after the Battle of Gettysburg, but I was not aware that he was similarly upset uh, later that fall, uh, as you mentioned. I just wanted to clarify, was he talking in the context of the Mine Run campaign, which was November of 63? Was he talking about the Bristol the Bristol campaign of October 63, or what exactly was the circumstances when he got uh, annoyed with Meade again? It was uh, October 63. Um, well, it was funny, Robert's recollections, um, remembering that telegram where Lincoln said, if you win, you take the glory, if you lose, I'll take all the blame. Well, Robert was adamant that his father wrote that in July. And everybody he told, he even once, he wanted to get into a public debate about it back in the 1870s. And Nicolay talked him out of it. Basically, Nicolay said, hey, you said we could write the book, and if you start giving out juicy pieces, then the book won't be that interesting. So that's insulting. What's wrong with you? And Robert said, oh, you're right. I'm sorry. I jumped the gun. But Robert actually thought that, what, that that telegram was from July, but it was only until I did further research that I realized that that occurred in October, and Robert was at the White House in October as well. He was there for both incidents where Lee was backed up against a river and Meade did not attack him. I don't remember the specific name of the, the actual campaign. Um, you know, it's in all the books somewhere. Yes, Jason, I enjoyed your paper very much. Thank you. A uh, question about um, the son being the protector of the father's reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, at Houghton Library, we have um, the, the archives of Houghton Mifflin. And in there, there are um, several letters from Robert Lincoln to the Those editors about um, <laughs> Alonzo Rothschild's second volume, mm -hmm. uh, the one that was published after his death called Honest Abe. Mm 
a study in integrity. And of course, um, Robert Todd was very much against them using that title, uh, tried to get them to change it, and as you know, um, they stuck with the widow's wish. That, but um, I didn't want to ask about that. I wanted to ask about Lord uh, Charwin's um, biography of Lincoln, Charmwoods. Um, I've come across some um, letters in our collection that refer to, to Robert Lincoln's anger at that biography, and what, what, why was he angry at Lord Charnwood? Biography. What was they, it? they still have Robert's copy of Lord Charnwood's book at Hill Dean, and in the first chapter, there's all Robert's notes in the margin. No exclamation, Xing out, not true exclamation. Um, it, it's interesting. Robert was very eager to read Charnwood's book because everybody talked so highly of it. Uh, but then Robert, uh, in the very first chapter, you know, Charnwood took a lot of his stuff from Herndon, and Robert really disliked Herndon's book. Actually, he never read Herndon's book. He disliked things that Herndon publicly said about his father, which, of course, he would have repeated in the book. And so I actually have a letter where Robert said, I, I haven't gotten past chapter one of Charnwood yet because it made me so angry I had to put it down. But I will get to it. But actually, the rest of the book has no notes in it. So I, I think he actually did not read the rest of the book. But it was, um, you know, Charnwood, the things that Robert noted down were um, um, all the, the things about Thomas Lincoln being lazy and Abraham Lincoln being illegitimate and a lot of this stuff that Herndon, Herndon wrote, uh, stuff like that. But no, Robert, that's a great story of Houghton Mifflin. Uh, Robert, he really admired Alonzo Rothschild's book, Lincoln, uh, Master of Men, I think it was called. But the second volume, as you said, was called Honest Abe. And Robert, he, he really was angry at the title. Robert, throughout his entire life, he was a micromanager. And I would hate him to have worked for him. Uh, you know, all the records of building his house in Vermont, all of his houses in Chicago... He was such a micromanager. It must have driven the people crazy. And so Houghton was uh, a college friend of his. And so he said, I heard about this. Um, I don't like that. Uh, Abe is a name my father did not like, and he never went by. said, people called him Mr. Lincoln, and his friends called him Lincoln. Nobody ever called him Abe. It's grotesque. It's offensive. And this was when, this was what, like 1918. So Robert, as he got older, he got a little more ornery when it came to his father's legacy. And, and so, and then they had this, there was a good six or eight letters back and forth, yeah. and Robert said, well, how about this title, this title? And then they said, well, how about this title, Robert Rovac? Well, let's change it. I mean, this micromanaging of trying, he's trying to come up with the title. And, of course, he didn't. But that's, you know, an interesting story. His son was named Abraham Lincoln II, and everybody always said that, um, you know, they called him Jack. They nicknamed him Jack. And uh, the theory is that, um, you know, Abraham was too long and formal, but Robert disliked Abe just like his father mm -hmm. disliked Abe. And so they came up with Jack. So. Question, sir? Uh, was there ever any move uh, to groom uh, Robert Lincoln as a presidential candidate? And if so, by whom? And how far did it progress? The Republicans tried to get Robert, to Lincoln, Robert Lincoln to run for every office from mayor of Chicago to president of the United States. <laughs> it's amazing. Every, and he, he never wanted anything to do with any of it. He allowed himself to be, um, he wasn't voted in, he was uh, unanimously selected to be the supervisor of the town of South Chicago. And he, um, it was just completely corrupt and bankrupt. They brought Robert in. He turned the entire town around up to, uh, so that they were actually making money and not losing money. He got rid of all the corruption. And that was one of the things he was most proud of, actually, his entire life, was his stewardship of South Chicago. But now the Republicans tried to draft him five times to run for president. In 1884, he, uh, this is amazing, he could, have been, he could have been president because I've got all these letters and telegrams back and forth, which basically it all boils down to Robert wanted nothing to do with any of it. And his friends were saying, what should I tell everyone at the convention? They want to put your name forward. And basically, Robert said, don't say anything unless Arthur gets renominated. Then telegraph me back. Arthur and Robert Lincoln had a great relationship. They were great friends, and they both greatly respected each other. And the way these letters read is that if Arthur had been nominated and he wanted Robert as his vice president, Robert would have said yes as his duty to the party, uh, which then, of course, Robert would have become president, which is pretty interesting. Uh, 1888 was the year that Robert was in the most danger of getting nominated against his will. 
Um, in 87, he very famously said to the Chicago Tribune, I consider the presidency a gilded prison. The care and worry outweigh, to my mind, the honor which surrounds the position. And then in 1912, uh, Roosevelt and a bunch of other people tried to get everyone to vote for Robert to get the nomination away from Taft. And uh, Robert, of course, told them not to do that. So yeah, um, Robert, it, it's amazing how consistent he was his entire life. He wanted nothing to do with electoral politics, but he, he did feel duty-bound as a Republican and as an American. If he was requested by a president, such as Secretary of War, Minister to Great Britain, to do something, that he would do it. I was just wondering whether it's that, that desire to separate himself from his father's legacy that led Robert and his family to be buried in Arlington National Cemetery rather than with the rest of the family in Springfield, or whether there was a completely different reason for that. That's a great question. When Robert died, he fully expected and believed he would be buried in Springfield. His wife chose not to. She, and actually, that letter just came out a few years ago. She wrote, she said, my husband was his own great man and he deserves his own place in the sun, apart from his illustrious father. And so she decided on Arlington because, as Secretary of War, he was uh, allowed to be buried there. Mm -hmm. And so then, um, about 10 years later, they, she moved their son, Abraham Lincoln II, from Springfield to there. So, and that's, that's as far as it goes. A lot of people said, well, Mary Harlan Lincoln hated Mary Todd Lincoln, and she didn't want to spend eternity next to her mother-in-law. <laughs> um, you know, I've never seen that to be true. You know, everybody says Mary Harlan Lincoln was an alcoholic, too. There is absolutely no evidence to support that one either. So, yeah, there's, you know, Robert's life and his family is fascinating. Um, there's not much known about them. There's no, not many good books about them. Um, you know, I just realized a couple of questions ago I didn't answer fully. Robert had three children. Mary Lincoln, the oldest daughter, Abraham Lincoln, the son, and then Jesse Lincoln, the third daughter. Jack died when he was uh, 16 in London from blood poisoning. Mamie married um, a historian and well-respected New Yorker named Charles Isham. They had one son named Abraham Lincoln Isham, but he just went by Lincoln, or the family called him Link. Uh, Jesse was the wild child. She eloped with a football player against Robert's wishes. When she came home, Robert locked her in her room for two days. <laughs> the media mulling around his house outside, waiting for something to happen, just like today. Um, Jesse actually ended up being married three times. But she had two children from the first marriage, um, Mary Lincoln Beckwith and Robert Todd Lincoln Beckwith, Peggy and Bud. All three of the grandchildren never had children. As far as I know, everything I've ever seen, all three of them purposely did not have children because they all disliked being Lincolns, they all felt like sideshow freaks, and they felt it was a curse, and they did not want to pass it on to another generation. As far as I can tell, uh, that could be wrong, but I've never seen anything to contradict that. Uh, we know that Robert Todd Lincoln Beckwith, um, he had a vasectomy when he was like 30 years old. So I think that kind of bolsters that opinion that he didn't want to have any kids. Um, so it's, you know, uh, Robert Lincoln's, you know, the generations kind of get less distinguished after Robert, uh, especially Bud and Peggy. Um, you know, they were spoiled brats and they admitted it. Bud liked, he liked loose women, he liked fast cars, and he liked lots of booze. And he wasn't ashamed to say it. <laughs> All right. Thank you.